Welcome to the Mets pod. On today's show, we recap all the latest moves, the new look rotation, including Kodai Senga, plus the return of Brandon Nimmo on a monster eight-year contract. We'll also dive into what's next for Billy Epler and Steve Cohen. So a reminder to subscribe to the Mets pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Mets Pod. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, joined as always by my co-host, Joe DeMeo. And a lot has happened, and we were with you not that long ago. Late on Wednesday into Thursday, the Mets have continued a crazy offseason, and I think none bigger, I'd argue right now, especially in terms of years and dollars, Joe, than Brandon Nimmo coming back on an eight-year contract um, obviously along the way, they also added David Robertson to the bullpen, Kodai Senga, the deal we've heard about for so long as the Mets finally tap into the Japanese market, the ace of Japan in Kodai Senga. He's a Met now as well. So we're going to get into everything. We're gonna, also going to look forward. We're not just going to look back at what deals got done, but what moves could also be on the table. But Joe, let's start right with Nimmo, right? Because this was, how many times did we ask? Well, if they don't get Nimmo back and we know it's going to be expensive and we know there's risk with his injury history and his age going into the 30s and and knowing that he's going to get long term, what is the plan? And it felt like nobody could truly answer that. It felt like the Mets were never comfortable with Marte moving to center field full time. Obviously, Cody Bellinger had already signed and that wasn't necessarily a solution that felt like more of throwing a dart at the wall. So, Joe, while the deal is huge. It does feel like, especially in the short term, a sigh of relief that Brandon Nimmo will be in center field for the Mets next year. I am definitely glad that we don't have to speculate on how they're somehow going to fill center field. Uh, Do I think the deal is, you know, a couple years, a year too long than what I would probably be most comfortable with? Yeah, I'd say so. But I think ultimately Nimmo got the money I thought he was going to get. I thought he was going to be in the 150 to 160 range. The Mets tack on another maybe year or two uh, on as far as length goes, and that trims down the AAV to essentially the qualifying offer price. So I think all in all, it's fair, um, and the Mets keep their center fielder. You know, I know one of the alternatives, uh, they did talk to the Arizona Diamondbacks about Alec Thomas, who's one of their young center fielders, and supposedly Arizona wanted Brett Beatty in exchange, which from a kind of prospect for prospect trade isn't really all that outlandish uh, but if your option is you can keep Beatty and pay Brandon Nimmo I think the the Mets made the right decision there yeah we've shown time we've seen time and time again that Cohen has protected what the Mets do have in the farm system which isn't an overwhelming amount of riches but they do have some high-end talent that's in baseball's top 100 prospects he'd rather protect that um, and keep the long-term idea of those players by spending in the short term. And I think not a lot of franchises are always willing to do that. Not a lot of franchises have the wealth and financial power to do that. And I think it's a huge advantage for the Mets that they have ownership that is willing to do that. And there will come a time where they have more volume, they have more quantity in the system, and they do rely on those guys to go get more cost-effective moves or they rely on those guys to come up and they're the impact player, not a hundred million dollar players all the time. But in the short term, Joe, this allows the Mets to contend for a world series while also keeping the long-term hope together. That's absolutely the goal. And, and, And I think they also looked, if you look at next year's free agent market, it's not really center fielders out there for next year either. So I think the Mets really looked and said, we don't even have a solution for now. And we don't have a solution for next year because there's not a prospect that I think is, you know, currently in the system that you look at and say, yeah, that person could be the center fielder in, you know, opening day 2024. So the Mets even had, you know, a bit of a longer term look on this. And, you know, Brand Nemo too, as as we get down the road and, you know, Alex Ramirez maybe develops or they use one of these many draft picks that they've held on to on center on a center fielder that develops. Uh, you know, Nimmo could shift to the corner as he gets closer to his, you know, mid 30s. So uh, there's certainly some risk, like we talked about with the injury history that Brandon Nimmo has. Um, but I felt like it was 
it almost proved that it was a necessity for the Mets to keep Nimmo. And if that meant going maybe a little out of your comfort zone and kind of away from uh, the plan of short-term high AAV, this was kind of the opposite approach of we kind of need this guy, so let's stretch the the length and keep the AAV down. Yeah, there's no doubt that there's always risk with a deal this long into a guy's 30s, a guy that has injuries. We, we're aware of all of that, and we've presented all of those things. But the reality is Nimmo's now here. He is a solution to what was a huge problem going into this offseason. And, and a side note to all of this, Joe, is Nimmo was drafted by the Mets in 2011 that you are you are more than fully aware of a high school player out of Wyoming. It doesn't happen very often in MLB draft circles, especially then. So he will be with the Mets now. He was drafted in 2011, signed through 2030. That in itself, there's something about keeping your homegrown talent. And I think by Nimmo staying here and Nimmo getting that kind of deal and Nimmo getting that kind of loyalty from this group, it does open the eyes of maybe a Pete Alonso, a Jeff McNeil, guys like that, especially when a week before Nimmo got his deal done, Jacob DeGrom walked out the door. Now, I want to be very clear here. It was obviously Jacob DeGrom's decision to walk out the door. There was never a sign that the Mets were looking at it and going, we're going to not take care of our own. We're going to let Jake leave. That was something he wanted. Nimmo, on the other hand, was very open to returning. And the Mets obviously went the extra mile to make sure that happens. And I really think it sends a clubhouse message to guys that this ownership group, while Yes, the eye is on the prize in the external market, whether it was Max, whether it was Verlander trading for Lindor. That's always exciting. But they also have dialed it in and will take care of the players that they believe in as part of the long term picture that have been here for a long time as well. I think that's a real important point. And, you know, fans by proxy are attracted to the homegrown player and they want to root for the guy that got drafted by the team or signed by the team, went through the minors, came through and is just a met two and through. And seems uh, to love it here. Yeah. yeah. And that, and brand Nemo loves it in New York. And I think, yeah, I think that's an important thing. And it's important, like you said, for Steve Cohen and this front office and ownership group and everyone to be like, if you are a homegrown player and you perform here, you will get rewarded. Yep. And you know, if the if they want to go somewhere else, like if you know down the road McNeil or Alonzo want to go somewhere else, they can take the Jacob Degrom path. Uh, but if they want to take the Brandon Nimmo path, I think it's evident the Mets are willing to you know reward their own. So Brandon Nimmo gonna be what we think will be a career Met at this point and a huge huge answer to their center field question of the offseason. Another massive question. It was a whole episode for us. The bullpen gets another massive addition. Edwin Diaz stays before free agency even kicks off. And Joe, the question we always had was, this bullpen is Edwin Diaz at the top, Drew Smith somewhere in the equation. We love Drew Smith on this show, but we also have the awareness to recognize Drew Smith isn't going to be handed the seventh or eighth inning going into spring training next year. And then everybody's hitting free agency, it felt like. And a lot of them are still out there in free agency. The Mets go out and get David Robertson, who... Everybody had their eye on at the trade deadline, including the Mets, who just wouldn't pay the price to go get him. The Phillies paid that price. Robertson gets a one-year, $10 million deal uh, that he represented himself for. So when this deal was announced, nobody knew, and he had already taken the physical. A very rare case in today's sports agency world. But Robertson, Joe, somebody that even at age, he'll be 38 this season. He will turn 38 in April Uh, Maybe one of the most consistent relievers of the last almost 15 years in baseball, going all the way back to the Yankees, but obviously his appearances in the National League as of recently uh, as well. It feels like the Mets got their eighth inning guy, that bridge to Diaz. I definitely think that's what they were looking for. And, you know, Robertson has the relationship going back, like you said, to the Yankees with Billy Epler. So there's familiarity there. Um, And, Yeah, I think it's a perfect fit. It was someone they pursued at the trade deadline. The cost was, you know, deemed prohibitive at the time in prospect capital. So they held firm. And, you know, just a few months later, they're able to to bring Robertson in. And you and I talked about this on the live shows and we talked about it on other podcasts throughout this last month plus uh, of the offseason that we really wanted to see Diaz in the ninth inning and kind of a 
a lockdown of sorts, true setup, man. I think David Robertson fits that mold. Um, they obviously acquired Brooks Raley, which we kind of touched on briefly during our winter meeting show there. Uh, Justin Verlander, I think kind of took some priority and, and Kodai Senga, but Brooks Raley uh, looks like a guy that's going to be a very important piece to this bullpen. And I don't think they're done here. Um, I, I think it may only be one more true veteran arm. Maybe that's a reunion with Adam Adovino as the offseason progresses. Uh, maybe it's show favorite Andrew Chafin. Um, there's quite a few relievers still available, and the Mets have so much uh, competition that I think you really want to embrace competition. I don't think they want to fill up the bullpen with external veteran guys. I think you and I have talked about that being not really a sustainable model or frankly, probably the best way to build a bullpen. But I mean, you look at the guys like Zach Green, who they took in the rule five draft, Steven Ridings, uh, who they claimed from the Yankees. Jeff Brigham was part of the trade with the Marlins. John Curtis was signed last year with an eye on being in the bullpen for 2023. Uh, Bryce Montez de Oca, we we talk about him plenty on this show. So the wild there's man. a lot of there's a lot of exciting power arms that the Mets have added, and I'd really like to see them give competition for one or two spots to those guys. Uh, but I do think there is one more veteran still to come, one way or another. It does feel that way, and and we always discuss where the Mets have an advantage on the market is in the one year deal area, because they can go to um, that number that a lot of teams can't Right, a lot of teams dealing with, I don't ever want to call it cash problems because these owners traditionally do not have cash problems. They set cash restrictions on themselves where they're looking to keep AAVs down. And, and to be fair, the Mets kind of had that strategy with Nimmo when Nimmo got eight years. Yes, it was jaw dropping. And you and I were never, pounding the table for Nimmo for eight years, but it, the market is what the market is. You can't often predict it. But the flip side was Nimmo's 20 million ish dollars a year, four to five years from now is going to kind of look like a borderline laugher for the center field market. I think the high end center field market, but where they can have that other advantage is when they do these things with a Robertson level player that, Hey, one year, $10 million. If it doesn't work out, there's no repercussions into the following year. And everything tells you this deal, for this deal to be a colossal disaster, would be a pretty big surprise when you look at the level Robertson's pitched at consistently. And one more thing I want to throw your way, Joe, because you led with it, and, and I really like that you did. Man, it feels like there's a narrative with Billy Epler that he's just this guy that gets to spend the richest owner in baseball's money. And everybody, when Epler misses, like a lot of people felt like at the deadline, which was fair criticism, he gets criticized. When they close deals, nobody cares. Everybody talks about Steve Cohen's money. And obviously, Steve Cohen's money is the ultimate deciding factor here. But how about Billy Epler right now? The relationship with Robertson in the past, his relationship going into that Japanese player market that we know he was so famously connected to with Shohei Otani. They get the deal done with Kodai Senga, which I'm going to transition right there in, in just a second. Billy Epler is showing that he can close deals in high level, in high profile situations. And while a lot of people think it might just be like MLB the show, you log on, you throw in a couple of negotiation numbers and you see if it works. It's a lot harder than that. So Billy Epler does deserve credit here for what they did, considering the time constraints in just one week. No doubt about it. Billy Epler is definitely proving to be a closer. And that goes back to last offseason, which, I mean, no one would say he did anything but ace last offseason with Max and Marte and uh, Canna and Escobar and Adovino, like fantastic offseason. And right now it's looking like he's having another fantastic offseason. So, yeah, I agree. It's a credit to him. But now that the heavy lifting may be done i mean i i put nothing past steve cohen anymore i just i i think we should learn a lesson and just say you know never say never on anything but i would guess their heavy heavy lifting is probably done and this is where billy epler makes his money this is where the pro scouting department this is where the analytics staff finding those under the radar guys now and find the guys that you can get to fill out the edges of these rosters because i think the the core of the team is kind of set so now how do you best fill this roster out at the edges? I think now this is where your money is made. Absolutely. The moves that do not get the high profile breaking news coverage. And then you look back in, you know, July, August, Adovino is a perfect example. Where would the Mets have the Mets 
you know, would not have gotten to where they wouldn't be able to close out so many games without Adovino because getting to Diaz was such a question mark for so long. And Adovino settled into that role. And, you know, another guy that they're looking to increase the ceiling of this team, right? There was plenty of floor moves. I think the Verlander DeGrom conversations, I think, have gotten absolutely ridiculous where everybody goes, there's no difference. Well, the difference is Verlander won the Cy Young and pitched an entire season while Jacob DeGrom came back for the end of it. That's a massive difference, but we could save that conversation for another day. Quintana, we know, is a floor signing. He's a guy that gives you a lot of innings. He's pretty decent pitcher. It's never going to be anybody's number one or number two, but a floor signing. Kodai Senga is just going up there and taking your best home run cut, Joe. And you know what? For a team that has championship aspirations, not looking to just, hey, let's win some games. Let's maybe win the wild card championship aspirations you you have to applaud the process of going in on Senga and the fact that the Mets infrastructure that they have two frontline starters ahead of him he's not going to be expected to be a hero in any sense but he is going to be expected to be Chris Bassett plus I think I think that's the goal here where the Senga signing not the craziest money per year, but still significant enough for an unknown when you come from the interma- international player market. This is absolutely the Mets taking that swing and going for gold. Kodai Senga, I'm very excited that the Mets were able to bring him in. I mean, right now they're paying him essentially what a number four type starter might get in free agency nowadays. I mean, look at what Taiwan Walker and Jamison Tyone signed for. Uh, that was more AAV uh, than Kodai Senga got. There's some risks coming from Japan. We know command. He needs work on his command. We know he needs work on his breaking pitches. Uh, but the fastball has touched upwards of 102. Uh, the splitter looks as good as you know any splitter coming out of Japan in recent memory. When you think of like Masahiro Tanaka, like the splitter is seemingly on par with that. So he still certainly needs some work. But I think he came to the right organization to figure that stuff out. Um, Senga spends a lot of time at driveline. That's where Eric Yeager's the new director of pitching for the Mets stems from. So there I'd be interested to know if there's a relationship there, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me if there was. And, you know, Jeremy Hefner is proving to be one of the best pitching coaches in the game. So I think they can maximize what Kodai Senga is capable of. And there's no question that he has the potential to be upwards of a number two type starter. If you could just refine the command a little bit get a little more shape on his breaking pitches. Uh, Just a really exciting move. And like you said, that foray into the Japanese and Asian market is something the Mets have simply not been a part of in a major way in a long time. And you probably have to go back to Kaz Matsui to the last time the Mets made, you know, this level of uh, a significant move in the Asian market. And, you know, I'm really interested to see how, how that all works when you think ahead. I mean, Andy Martino said during the winter meeting shows and everything, you know, keep an eye on Shohei Otani for next year. Like this is, you know, kind of, does this help with that down the road? I'm not sure, but ultimately the Mets got a high upside guy in Kodai Senga that I think you can, the risk that's there is mitigated a bit by their level of starting pitching depth. Cause we, you talked about Verlander and they have Quintana and now it's Carlos Carrasco. David Peterson, Tyler McGill, Joey Lucchese, Eliezer Hernandez, Jose Buto. Like the Mets are 10 deep right now. So uh, they're well positioned, I think, to take this risk. And like you said, it has the opportunity to raise the ceiling of this team in a significant way. And I'll say this as well. The Mets did for all the talk about the Mets spending and the Mets have been spending. There's no denying it. We always talk about Quintana being Walker's replacement. We talk about now Senga being Bassett's replacement. The Mets are still looking for value. They are still looking, hey, we're going to let some guys walk that we think are going to get paid handsomely somewhere else, maybe a number we're not willing to go, and we think we can replace them and still find value. Chris Bassett and Taiwan Walker combined this year are making almost $40 million. When you look at Kodai Senga and Quintana, their replacements combined, they're making under $30 million. So that's about $12 million of a difference where the Mets think Quintana and Senga, in their eyes, could be better than Bassett and Walker, plus the $12 million that is almost the full option for Carrasco's deal or Robertson 
plus Vogelback's money. The, these are the way you shift all the puzzle pieces while saying we got better, but we also understood the market better than a lot of teams. And the last thing is the Mets didn't just go out and give Senga the most ridiculous amount of money. The Mets had to, any team courting Senga had to show, because it's a huge transition, him coming, and you're right about him going to driveline. I think that makes the transition so much better for him. But him going from playing baseball in Japan to coming to the major leagues where he's dominated in Japan for a ver almost the better part of the last decade, still a massive transition. Teams had to show they were the right place for him. Pitching development, uh, resources, will to win, team culture, all those things. And Senga chose the Mets. He did. And that's the big thing because, you know, the Padres were heavy in on him and we know his kind of best friend is you Darvish. So he chose the Mets kind of overplaying with his best friend. And, you know, when you look at this contract, I was pleasantly surprised when I saw the number because when I saw what Masataka Yoshida signed with the Boston Red Sox for the outfielder, 90 million with the posting, taking it over to 100 million in value. And Senga was considered a bigger Japanese prospect for this offseason than Yoshida was. So I was like, okay, well, Senga might end up in that 100 mil range, but it's, you know, a longer term, maybe it's six or seven years. Mets be able to pull him in at five for 75 and including that app, that opt out after three. I think it's a, I think it's a perfect contract for both parties. You know, Senga gets paid nicely to come over here. And if he performs to that potential that we, that we spoke about, he can opt out after three years, he'll be, you know, 33 years old and have the opportunity to cash in again. And if he ends up just being, you know, a back end guy, which is certainly a, a possible outcome, you know, he's making $15 million a year. That's not the worst thing in the world. It's not a, a handicapping, hamstringing right. kind of move. It's it's a risk assessment that the Mets were willing to make. So, whoo, man, need a breather. A lot of moves to the Mets. It's just, it's crazy when you look at how quickly they can pivot. And our, and you and I, our eyes kind of widened when we had Gelbs on. And Gelbs really hammered the table saying three pitchers. And it felt like in our heads for the longest time it was ace at the top, whether that's DeGrom returning or his replacement. They did. They got Verlander. And then somebody for the middle of the rotation. And I think, and I'm guilty of this, I always assumed that Walker's replacement would be the Peterson-McGill competition. And the Mets have protected... The theme of this show is you can never have enough arms because we sit here every winter going to spring. We go, here's the arms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We think they're good. And then arm number 11 is starting a game in June or July every single year. So the Mets obviously not really, I would say, learning from their mistakes because I don't really think that's fair to classify it as a mistake, but giving themselves even more protection in this rotation. Yeah, when Gelb said he wanted three starters, if I'm being honest, my thought was like, damn, Gelb's is getting real greedy around here. And I mean, he was spot on. There's no question about it. And the Mets obviously agreed. They went, they got three starters. They're now 10 deep in reasonable starting pitching, you know, for the major league depth. And yeah, they're they're in a they're in a great spot. And now now they can afford to be creative. You know, we can talk about Carlos Carrasco potentially being on the block uh, at this point. They've like I said, I think they've done their heavy lifting. So now you look at what can you get for a Carrasco? Can you move a James McCann? Do you want to listen on a Mark Canna or an Eduardo Escobar? Like now you can get really creative and kind of uh, I don't I don't want to say have fun with it, but kind of have fun with it. I'll ask you a simple one, Joe, before we get to uh, we're going to move on eventually, close this thing out and get to some mailbag questions. What's your favorite move of the offseason right now? And it, it, I'll classify it like this. It could even be not going somewhere with a free agent that walked. It can be a deal that got done. It could be a strategy. What has been your favorite aspect of this offseason? My favorite move is luring in Kodai Senga. Like, I think Justin Verlander's a bigger impact, obviously. I think, you know, the reigning Cy Young Award winner. But I think signing Senga says so much about where this organization is headed. And 
you know, in the analytical world of a guy like Senga, who's so driven by that. And to the point he chose the Mets based on where they're at Verlander even referenced the analytics department in his interview with his brother. Uh, so to me, and, and you know, me, I'm the prospect guy. I'm the draft guy. I'm, I'm addicted to upside. So like, I appreciate the floors of Verlander and Quintana and they're going to be massive pieces to the Mets success in 2023. And Brandon Nimmo coming back is a great move. David Robertson locking up kind of the eighth inning spot is a great move, but I'm addicted to upside. And while Senga has that downside of, you know, there are some teams in the sport that believe he ends up a reliever long-term. So the, the risk is there. And, you know, the Mets obviously with the contract that they gave him don't agree with that assessment, but you know, he could be a back end guy, but I'm addicted to the potential of one Oh two with a wipeout splitter, improve the the other breaking balls. And could you have two aces and a number two on your staff? That'd be pretty good. What a world that would be to see yeah. Max and Verlander, duking it out for the Cy Young. And then, oh, yeah, Kodai Senga is that. So he should be Rookie of the Year eligible, though, correct? Oh, yeah. Can you come over yeah. from? Yeah. Yep. So Kodai Senga going for Rookie of the Year with the two aces is duking it out for Cy Young. Would be a perfect world to live in. I'll kind of piggyback off of yours because I could sit here and say Verlander is my favorite move. How could it not be, right? You have the Cy Young winner from the American League. Man, I just like how in cohesion... They are with Hefner and pitching development to the arms they bring in. The, the, your Senga points are perfect, Joe. I'll even back it up with the value of Quintana and then the strategy of quantity in the bullpen paired with two top dogs. We know what Edwin Diaz is. Edwin Diaz deserved every dollar of that contract. You and I were, we'd sign up to keep Edwin Diaz back pretty much no matter what. Robertson, one year deal, but can be a high end eighth inning guy. And then a, just a massive amount of arms that really fit an analytical profile, mostly on the slider, that they think one or two of them is going to hit for almost the minimum to be sixth or seventh inning guys. That tells me the Mets are, yes, all the headlines, understandably so, are Steve Cohen will do whatever Steve Cohen wants. And that's fun. It's awesome. And it gives the Mets a chance to win a World Series. But what's sustainable for a baseball organization is development. And it feels like the Mets are just as in on development and you don't hear about it. Probably you probably the most you hear about it maybe is on this show because Joe Joe is a prospect guy and a development guy. And that's we're obsessed with team building. That's what this show was built on. And I think the commitment to that aspect simultaneously while spending big and trying to be a short term winner is just my favorite thing about the organization right now. It's definitely trending in the in the right direction where they should be going. And, you know, they didn't forfeit any draft picks for any of these players that they signed. They avoided guys with qualifying offers attached. They even get a couple comp picks with Chris Bassett and Jacob deGrom leaving that come in after the fourth round. So they're going to continue to be aggressive in the draft. And you, you're seeing the investments into the player development. And as a Mets fan, if you want to continually see Steve Cohen play at the top of the free agent market, the Shohei Otanis, the Juan Sotos, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. down the road, or whatever young superstar that will eventually become a free agent, if you want the Mets and Steve Cohen to constantly be um, in play for those type of guys, it's imperative that these prospects get developed and take over jobs, like you said, you know, I hate to put it, you know, in a financial sense, but take over as a minimum salary player that increases your financial flexibility to give out those long, big money contracts that they've tried to avoid for now. Uh, but you're not going to be able to avoid forever. And we'll get to exactly that. But a reminder, you're listening to the Mets pod. Subscribe to the Mets pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. Joe, let's get into the mailbag because the mailbag essentially was our rundown. I just want to shout out the listeners that tweet at you every single week. It's been overwhelming to see your mailbag tweet grow from, hey, five, six replies to what, 50 replies these days. It just goes to show you how invested everybody is right now in the Mets, and it's awesome to watch. So let's start with the big one here. This is from at Jets Mets underscore, who said, what is the blueprint? to Shohei Otani being a Met. And obviously this conversation, you know, kind of comes from uh, Andy Martino, SNY MLB insider, said that, I, I believe it was, this isn't verbatim, but that the Mets could have their eyes on Otani, even if not at the deadline when he's expected to hit free agency after the year, which is just crazy to think about. I don't think we've ever seen somebody, Aaron Judge included, 
with that kind of skill set and demand hit free agency. So, Joe, what is the blueprint to Otani being a Met? Is it acquiring him for a heap load of a heaping amount of prospects at the deadline, or is it wait this thing out and pay the man $60 million a year? I, I really think it's going to get there. I'm waiting it out. Um, definitely no matter waiting what. it out. Pretty, I mean, I'm with, I'm I with mean, you, though. Yeah. I guess it depends on what the cost is. But like you said, if it's a heaping level of prospects, which I imagine it would be, uh, I think at that point, Otani is two months from free agency and he's looking at teams like the Dodgers, teams like the Mets, teams like the Yankees that could potentially be involved on him. Um, I don't think he's signing an instant extension with pretty much anybody at the deadline. And if he gets traded at the deadline, it's even better because he can't have the qualifying offer attached to him. So then you could sign him and not even lose draft picks. Uh, so I would stay away, I think, largely at the deadline, um, obviously cost dependent. But right now, the Mets are slated to have over $60 million come off the books after this coming season. Um, potential for over 100 if Max Scherzer were to opt out, which you know we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll talk about that here in a few months. But they have money coming off the books that can kind of be funneled Shohei Otani's way and I think the blueprint is get him the free agency and have Steve Cohen ready with the checkbook and Billy Epler ready with the recruiting pitches and I think you could certainly see Shohei Otani as a member of the 2024 New York Mets. Otani will hit free agency at 29 years old. He's been an offensive force in four of his five um MLB seasons and the only one where he struggled was the COVID 2020 shortened season he only played 44 games every other year Joe he's had an OPS of at least 848 two of the years he's had an OPS in the 900s so this is a player that gets on base he hits for power and he seems to be getting better as it goes on as a pitcher when you look at the jump from 2021 where he had a 3.18 ERA and struck out a little under 11 batters over nine. 2022, a 233 ERA in 28 starts, striking out almost 12 batters over nine. So, Otani, it, Joe, honestly, I, I don't really know how you place the right proper value on a healthy Otani because he's instantly one of the best DHs in the National League, and he's a Cy Young candidate right away in the National League. And when you look at the Mets next year, why it makes so much sense, no matter the price, because the Mets will have a hole at DH because we're assuming in 2024, Francisco Alvarez will be the full-time catcher. And if Max Scherzer ultimately ends up leaving, they have another hole at the top of the rotation. So I, this isn't just drawing conclusions. This is truly, dare I say, a match made in heaven for the Mets. It makes a ton of sense. And uh, the value, like you said, no idea. I mean, I can't even fathom a good guess at this point. You have, I mean, you just assume it's going to be a record setting AEV that, that I think probably goes without saying, but who knows? There's no comparable, right? Like that's the thing. When we, when we talk about what guys are quote unquote worth and what they should get contractually, we use other similar type players as a reference point. Like when the Mets were talking to Justin Verlander, it's like, he is base. He just feels like he's Max Scherzer again, and boom, he gets Max Scherzer dollars. So uh, there's nothing to compare Shohei Otani against. I mean, do you just like combine the value of a big time DH and an ace pitcher and just like add it up and say this is what he's worth? Uh, I have no idea, but it's going to be crazy money. And you know, I think the Mets are not necessarily quote unquote planning for it, but I think it is certainly in their mind of this is something we want to heavily pursue next year. And I think the competition for Otani will be a little more fierce uh, than the competition for say a Justin Verlander, who we recognize everything that comes with that. But there was really only one or two teams that were willing to talk a big money deal for a 40 year old pitcher, a 29 year old generational talent. Uh, God, Shohei Otani is going to get quite a bit. So that'll be a, that'll be a fun thing to follow a year from now. Yeah, there is no player in baseball, I'm pretty sure right now, making even close to $50 million a year. And I feel pretty comfortable in saying that Otani is going to make $60 million plus a year when he gets. And maybe not because baseball, yeah. the market, into, you know, we saw a market get pretty crazy this year, which was a good thing for the league, by the way. Um, so we'll see where that goes and and we'll we'll save. We'll keep some of that 
you know, in our pockets right now. We don't need to empty the Otani bag on this show. The Mets have so many other things going on. So let's get into more mailbag questions here for the show. Taylor uh, Murr says, can you give your thoughts on the recent rumblings of Carlos Correa? It seems there is something there. Even Steve Cohen liked to tweet about it. So Steve Cohen doesn't just go on tweet liking rampages. That's why this kind of blew up because it was, you know, a rare tweet that he liked. It didn't mention Correa. Um, I think Steve Phillips, I want to say, while not having the Mets as a favorite, said they could be nibbling something along the lines of that. It was I think he said dabbling. Dabbling? I think he said they dabble. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Um, so anyway, this would be a massive contract. One that, as much as we say, expect the unexpected in this regime, I am not expecting the Mets to go get Carlos Correa this offseason. And I think it ties back to the, not just Otani specifically, but keeping flexibility to land a megastar next year again. The only world I see Correa coming to the Mets, Joe, is if he took another one-year pillow contract. Sure, the, the number would be massive. You're looking at 35 to $40 million a year, I think, if he took that kind of deal. To play with Lindor, who we know there's a relationship there from the World Baseball Classic, and he would be moving to third base. So I, th- I think it's the like- the, it's very unlikely, but it is fun to think about with the way Correa would fit with this team. I consider it very unlikely as well, um, but I, I have learned my lesson. I will not count anything out when it comes to Steve Cohen. Do I think they're going to be the team if Correa gets that 300, that Trey Turner contract, that Xander Bogarts contract, which I can't understand why he wouldn't get at least those guys money. Uh, but hey, if it dries whatever, up, though, yeah, if for whatever reason it does dry up, which the Giants need somebody to take their money. Like they're just going around. They're just going around to everyone saying, we have a lot of money, please take it. And everyone's just like, nah, we're good. So, you know, maybe that continues and Correa does fall through the cracks and, you know, always be flexible. And, you know, they're, they're paying the Steve Cohen tax anyway. So if you could get that pillow contract, go for it. But, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't think too, too much into Steve Cohen liking a tweet about Correa, but it, it certainly is something to, uh, you know, have fun dreaming about it. And, you know, maybe we do come on and we're doing a show at some point that they sign Carlos Correa. I just, uh, I, I don't see it happening. Yeah. It feels like, um, once again, a lot of things would have to go in the wrong direction for Correa's market for it to get to that point. This one from Merrill Brown. He said, did the Mets try to keep Bassett rare example of a guy from nowhere who shows up in New York city is jazzed about it and is immediately productive, a real competitor. I think with Bassett, The Mets were always concerned about the term for Bassett. Bassett is the rare case of a free agent that did not get to the market until he he will turn 34 um, in February. So he on this new contract, he's debuting on this contract as a 34 year old. It felt like a lot of the projections for Bassett and jump in anytime if I'm wrong here, Joe, had him getting to four years. So you're talking about age 34, 35, 36, 37 season for a guy that while, yes, he's an innings horse, he does not strike out a ton of people. We've seen him get into trouble at times, especially in some big games for the Mets last year, not to take away from Bassett, who you do that trade 10 out of 10 times every time. But I think with Bassett, it was more about not paying another long-term contract for a guy that'll get into the wrong side of 34 35 eventually and the Mets instead pivoted somewhere else for a cheaper option with more upside and Kodai Senga yeah I think you know there there's no reason to ding Chris Bassett at all he was a great trade acquisition he was fantastic for the Mets in 2022 he did everything that they asked of him he took the ball every fifth day he went out he pitched deep in the games he he was one of the few pitchers that we had seen for the Mets that was willing to drive his pitch count up to that 110, 115 range, yeah. you know, almost, almost consistently. So there's no bad words that are going to come from me about Chris Bassett. And frankly, I think he got a contract that I would have been fine with the Mets giving him. Sure. He ended up, he ended up three years around 21 million a year or whatever it ended up being yep. like that sounded about right for me. And I think the Mets just decided to, Go with the Kodai Senga, who, like you said, when when you factor in the age, if Senga plays out his entire five-year contract with the New York Mets, it'll be ending 
basically in what would be year two of Chris Bassett's contract. So you're getting the rest of Kodai Senga's prime and, you know, you know, maybe getting out when he starts to reach that mid thirties range. So I, I think it was a bit of uh risk mitigation on the age side of things, uh, but you know, good for Bassett. I think he's a great fit for Toronto. And, you know, I, I think the Mets wanted to push for some upside. They had some floor with Quintana and, uh, they're confident, obviously, in what Justin Verlander is going to be able to provide. I think they said, let's shoot for kind of gold with Senga instead of, you know, taking a guy like Bassett, who you know is just going to take the ball and he's going to be perfectly solid. Uh, they, they just wanted to shoot for a little more. We talk so much, and I'm guilty of it, of, you know, Senga being the replacement for Bassett and Quintana being the replacement for Walker. But, you know, it's kind of funny, Joe, when you just look at the numbers, Quintana made 32 starts last year. Bassett made 30. That's an incredible accomplishment by both guys. Quintana actually had a lower ERA than, and didn't pitch as many innings as Bassett, but it just goes to show you maybe the Mets actually view Quintana as almost co comparable to Bassett, and then they're getting more upside in a guy like Senga. So there's a lot of different ways of looking at it, but I'm with you. I will always root for Chris Bassett, especially on the Blue Jays. Um, I thought he, he was... You know, everything and more the Mets could have hoped for when they made that trade, a very successful trade when you're looking back at it. And um, and I'm glad he got that contract. So, all right, one more question on the show. And this is kind of the golden question, I think, in Mets land right now. This one from uh, Nunya, who said, what hitter should the Mets add to round out the lineup? Maybe a fourth outfielder who can also DH against lefties. Players that come to mind, Duvall, Drury, J.D. Martinez. I I like the framing of this question because I think it's very realistic. While we don't think the Mets are just going to go crazy and go get Correa, this could be the market they could play in. And Joe, I think everybody kind of has their eyes on and goes, what is J.D. Martinez's contract going to look like? Because is that one the Mets could swoop in and steal on a very short-term, bloated, one-year-ish kind of deal? I think they could. I, I don't I see so why too. not, as long as his back checks out. But I think... I think Barking up the right shoe when you talk about almost like fourth outfielder almost type, like when they acquired Darren Ruff, you know, obviously we don't have to talk about how it didn't work out, but the vision was this is a guy who has historically ma matched lefties even recently. So it's not like you're going back far in time to find Darren Ruff hitting lefties. Uh, and he also can play first base. He can play the corner outfield spots, kind of like he could stand out there if, if you need him to. So I think you're going to see the Mets pursue someone that does something similar. I think Adam Duvall crushes lefties. He's a good defensive player that could actually even play some. Yeah. And he could play some center field for you, too. I think he was plus four OOA um, in, in center field this year. So I think he fits really well. I think Trey Mancini is a name that we, we should keep an eye on. We talked about him at the trade deadline. Obviously, he has the relationship with Buck Showalter. He struggled in Houston, but he has the ability to kind of play multiple spots. And J.D. Martinez is kind of your prototypical slugger that you have to check out the back, make sure everything checks out there. Uh, but the defensive versatility there is probably lacking. So I'm interested to see where the Mets go, because I do think they need to add one more bat. And that bat could be someone that shares time at DH, spends some time in the outfield. I think I'd be hard-pressed to sign another pure dh where now you're carrying two players whose only job is to hit I, I don't think that's the best uh use of roster spots i like the idea of duvall when you're looking at buy low guys and how much of a contrast he is compared to the rest of the roster right the mets are by nature a work the count high on base make contact type of team and that that stretches really throughout most of the lineup but when you look at the top of it with nimmo McNeil is that way. Canna is that way. Duvall is almost all of the opposite of what the Mets have. And sometimes you need that contrast. Duvall is a guy that his career on base is below 300. But Duvall has hit over 30 home runs three times in the last six seasons. And that's a that's a pretty serious metric where you're looking at it. He's somebody that has serious power. Like you said, Joe, quietly has some defensive versatility that I think a lot of people overlook. So... His season last year was kind of ruined by injury in Atlanta, but the year before that, splitting with Miami and Atlanta, he had 38 home runs. Um, and he's not a huge OPS guy because he just doesn't get on base a lot. But the power that he brings to a spot that, let's be real, 
the Mets are not batting their right-handed DH in the top five of the lineup ever. This is never going to happen. Even top six feels like a stretch at times, depending what Francisco Alvarez or Brett Beatty do going into next year. So I think they are absolutely on the by the low side of that maybe rough insurance, if not rough replacement. It makes and it makes total sense because they could use a little more uh kind of thump and Duval, like like I said, is is another guy that smashes left-handed pitching. So I think he fits really, really well. And maybe he's a guy you could get for one year and I don't know, five million, six million, where it's a, a lower cost investment because he doesn't bring kind of that uh full, fully uh rounded out skill set. He's kind of a power and some defense guy. So I think he makes a ton of sense, but I, I would keep an eye on kind of the right-handed bats that hit lefties and have some defensive versatility. I think those are the guys that the Mets are looking at. Cause when you look at the roster right now, the fourth outfielder is Khalil Lee and um, Khalil Lee is not going to be the fourth not outfielder. Majorly level. Day. Yeah. So they, they need something there and I'm interested to see uh, where they address it and they could take their time. That's the thing. Like now, this offseason has the potential to get a little long on us. The Mets did so much. They did so much of their lifting. Like we might be watching a lot of players go to other teams while the Mets kind of play out the market for here over the next month. Yeah, we know that holiday lull kind of kicks in with baseball sometimes. Um, Besides, you know, Dylan Batanzas under the tree for Mets fans, the holiday lull, you know, often can, can be a break for everybody. Some of the, I mean, some of these guys need a day off. We were reading how, Steve Cohen told Billy Epler on a Sunday after all this craziness, like turn the phone off. Don't call me for once. Like kind of situation where, you know, everybody will breathe. They'll see the market play out. And that's when the Ottavino type of deals happen, right? You might get a reliever that has a long track record, needs a bounce back on a one year, $4 million deal. Like you said, Joe, you might get that fourth outfielder for two to $5 million. So the, the moves that happen now, while they don't get the headlines, can sometimes mean the most in the long run to your team. So we'll be covering all of those because, a reminder, we are going anywhere throughout the entire offseason. We will be with you in the middle of the week, every week, all the way up and through opening day and into the season. So a reminder to subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll catch you next week.